In today's video, we will be talking about Emperor Paul of Russia, often referred to as the Mad Tsar. Paul was born on the 1st of October 1754 in St. Petersburg as the first-born son of Grand Duke Peter and Grand Duchess Catherine of Russia. It is doubtful who fathered Paul, since Catherine had an affair with Sergei Sartikov at that time. But after nine years of marriage, he was the long-hoped-for heir to the throne of Russia, and reigning Empress Elizabeth was too excited to care about genetics. Right after Paul's birth, Empress Elizabeth had him taken away from his mother and placed the infant in her chambers. For the first seven years of his life, he was raised at the court of Empress Elizabeth, who considered to appoint him as her heir instead of Grand Duke Peter. There is not a whole lot of information about Paul's childhood, but it is certain that his early years were quite unstable. He was alternately shot with affection from Empress Elizabeth and neglected. On one occasion, one of Elizabeth's chambermaids found the infant Paul laying on the floor next to his crib asleep. He must have fallen out of his bed during the night, but no one noticed until the following morning. From 1760 on, Paul's education was placed in the hands of the trustworthy governor Nikita Panin. Panin was one of the greatest minds of his time, but his education style was said to be very chaotic. As a result, Paul had little knowledge in important matters, and his character was not formed to be an emperor. Besides that, his diet was nutritionally deficient from a modern viewpoint, which resulted in Paul being a sickly child. Nevertheless, some described him as an intelligent and sweet little boy, as his unusual looks as an adult stemmed from a tuberculosis infection, which affected especially his face. Being denied forming a bond with either parent, he grew up being mostly ignored, yet immensely important as the son of the now reigning Empress Catherine the Great. In his teenage years, Paul's temper surfaced. He became known for his random outbursts of rage. At one occasion, he ended up dismissing an entire platoon only for losing its order. Contemporaries reported his sudden mood swings, which often resulted in violent outbreaks. It is safe to say that the murder of his father Peter had a major impact on Paul, being a boy of seven years at the time. Even if there was no significant connection between father and son, Paul blamed his mother Catherine greatly for the murder of his father and he grew to despise her. Catherine the Great might have been a grand ruler, but it is fair to say that she failed as a mother. From Paul's birth up to the passing of Empress Elizabeth, she had limited access to her son and she was not able to form a relationship with him. But after overpowering her husband and taking the throne, it does not appear as if she made a big effort to bond with Paul. It is even delivered that she called her son ugly and stupid. One can assume that she was more concerned over her son may overthrow her one day since many nobles saw him as the rightful ruler of Russia instead of her. The mistrust between mother and son was mutual, but Catherine, having the dilemma of Paul being her only surviving child, had to think dynastically. When Paul came of age, he was married to Princess Wilhelmina of Hessen-Darmstadt in 1773, who became Natalia Alexievna. The marriage was short-lived, Natalia and her baby died in childbirth in 1776. This made Paul a widower at the age of 21, so a new marriage was formed the same year with Princess Sophia Dorothea of Württemberg. Unlike his first wife, Sophia, who took the name of Maria Feodorovna, was faithful to Paul and the couple was somewhat devoted to each other. Together, they had ten children, 
of which two became future emperors. For the birth of their first daughter, Empress Catherine gifted them with Gacina, an estate outside of St. Petersburg. It was here that Paul engaged in his passion, constantly drilling his soldiers with strict precision, day in and day out. Being purposely left out of state affairs by his mother and without a true purpose, Paul became more and more awed in his behavior. Even though Paul was said to be an affectionate father at times, he was strict and often unpredictable. His son Alexander liked to visit Paul at Gachina, since he tried to escape marriage life and the Polish court of Empress Catherine. However, after Paul gained the throne, Alexander disliked his father as an emperor and is cited to have said, Russia has become a plaything for the insane under his father. Alexander's wife, Elizabeth Alexievna, described Paul in a letter to her mother as disgusting, feared and hated. Paul grew generally suspicious of his surroundings, including his wife and son. This irrational thought did not come out of the blue since Paul had taken two mistresses, who were once Maria's ladies-in-waiting, and these backstabbers had a major influence on him. Furthermore, after experiencing how his mother overpowered her husband shortly after gaining the throne, he feared the same happening to him. Paul's main concern was Empress Catherine, though, who prevented him from taking any part in the government. In the position of the future Tsar, Paul felt strongly about the rejection of his mother. At times, he was even convinced that Catherine was plotting to kill him. If that was actually true, is not certain, but what we know is that the Empress was indeed planning to place Paul's son Alexander on the throne instead of him. In the end, she couldn't go through with her plan, as Catherine died unexpected in 1796. Thus, at the age of 42, Paul became Tsar of Russia. He immediately set out to undo as much of his mother's work as possible. In this, he was driven by spite instead of wanting to improve matters. Nevertheless, one of his first actions was aiming at stabilizing the Russian monarchy by reforming the law of succession. His great-grandfather Peter the Great determined that the ruler of Russia should be allowed to choose his successor. While the fundamental idea of choosing someone competent for the throne appeared to be a reasonable concept, it turned out to destabilize the Russian monarchy greatly. It panelled three powerless revolutions with three emperors being deposed. To correct this, the new Tsar Paul established an orderly succession to the throne for the male line. Paul's reign in general is viewed as very unstable and chaotic. To the nobility, Peter was a scourge. He wore the titles randomly and sought to take back the privileges they had gained under Catherine. One of Paul's biggest issues was his lack of political cleverness and stability. Instead of being diplomatic, he openly struck out at Catherine's former favorites and made them his enemies. Over the time, Paul was ill reputed as the peasant czar. One of his first reforms was the Manifesto on Serfs and Landlords, which was a starting point for easing serfdom's rules. While this might seem like a humanist approach from a modern perspective, it enraged the nobility. Paul fatally underestimated the importance of having a solid relationship with the nobility and tormented them with his ever-changing regulations. The confidence in his inability to reign declined more and more over time, as he was inconsistent, for instance, with foreign policies. Starting off with a peaceful demeanor, at one point Paul maneuvered Russia into the disadvantageous position of being officially at war with France and unofficially at war with Great Britain, being without diplomatic relations with Austria, and if that wasn't enough already, he was on the verge of sending an army through the unknown landscapes of Central Asia to invade British-controlled India. Paul did not only antagonize the nobility and his officials, but also his beloved military. He took the Prussian army as inspiration when it came to fashion and rules. He imposed new standards on the military, which included harsh punishments for underperforming officers. Sometimes, 
The emperor liked to carry out the physical punishments himself, often followed by exile in Siberia for the penalized officer. Paul expected militaristic discipline and unconditional obedience from everyone around him and burst out into fits of rage even for the smallest aberration from his will. As a result, Paul became widely unpopular and, as it was common for the Russian nobility, conspiracies were starting to unfold. By 1800, a plot was organized by Count van der Palen, who was St. Petersburg's military governor and a confidant of Paul, Kampanin and Admiral Rebus. On the night of the 11th of March, Paul was murdered in his bedroom in St. Michael, the immense fortress that was built near the turn of the century. A band of dismissed officers, headed by General Bennigsen, burst into his bedroom after supping together and, filled by alcohol, the conspirators forced Paul to the table and tried making him sign his abdication. Paul refused and offered some resistance. Amid the melee, one of the assassins struck him with a sword, and he was then strangled and trampled to death. He died at the age of 46, after only four years of reign. Paul is often referred to as the Mad Tsar, even though his reputation gained more acknowledgement in the modern age. He is often blamed for his erratic and untrusting demeanor. But was his paranoia that paranoid? To begin with, the Russian history is filled with rewards against the rulers, often ending in their assassinations. It was common for the Russian nobility to conspire and plot against the ruler. And looking at Paul's definite fate, how mad was he? We know now that Paul was in acute danger a lot of the time. Even though he was not in the public focus during Catherine the Great's reign, he was still the Empress's only child. Thus. Paul had a target on his back. Some of his allegations might appear to be a bit lunatic, as he accused his mother once of ordering the cook to mix broken glass in his meals. It is uncertain how far Catherine's aversion of her son reached, and historians are still not sure whether the Tsarina did consider to have her son killed at one point. To be fair, it does not seem to be completely unimaginable that Catherine wanted her son to be disposed, considering what happened to her husband. Can we blame Paul for being suspicious of his mother then? Based on his already untrusting demeanor and experiencing his father's downfall, he grew suspicious of his wife and even his children over time. There is no evidence that his wife was ever untrustworthy. But we must put into consideration that his son, Alexander, was informed about the assassination plans and was present in St. Michael's during the murder. He probably was not involved in plotting the plans and had refused previous offers from conspirators to put him on the throne. Eventually, he sure did not prevent the assassination of his father. Besides, Paul was often blamed for his immense passion for the military. He was very fond of strict rules and discipline, which reflected his idea of ruling. With his newly imposed dress code, the officers were forced to wear stiff, unpractical uniforms and were prohibited to wear scarves and such, as it was not part of the uniform. These rules appeared to be a bit silly, considering the lack of practicality and the Russian winters. But was his passion for military crazy? Paul was kept away from all governmental affairs, and without a true purpose, he put most of his time into the military. We could assume that he must have been really bored being left out. It shouldn't come as a huge surprise that someone with too much time on his hands ends up putting his effort into unlikely matters. On the other hand, Paul tended to be cruel and violent with his soldiers often imposing draconic punishments for the slightest mistakes. To be fair, cruelty was an all too common trait in absolutistic emperors back then. If we look at Paul's great-grandfather, Peter the Great, he was well known for his cruel punishments and torture orgies. The difference seems to be the lack of trust and respect that people had in Paul opposed to his great-grandfather. 
Many subjects feared Paul's temper, but they did not respect him as a person nor as a ruler. Looking at his political conduct, Paul was indeed inconsistent. Considering his reforms for serfdom, we could count that as one of his accomplishments. Needless to say, these reforms angered the sport nobility and attributed to Paul's downfall. Comparing his reforms and policies with other rulers, he didn't stick out to be overly successful. But are there indicators for madness in his way of ruling? If we remember that Paul was never prepared to take the throne one day, neither in his education nor by his exclusion in state administration, what was to be expected of him? Then we have his so-called paranoia, or fear of being killed, which resulted in him building St. Michael's. It contained many secret hallways, doors and chambers. As we know now, this couldn't protect him from his greatest fear. In the end, his worst nightmare came true and he was eventually killed. Of course, Paul's undiplomatic and erratic behavior contributed to his assassination and he did little to keep peace with the nobility. Nevertheless, he was right in the end and suffered the same fate as his father. All in all, it is likely that Paul was mentally unstable to an extent, considering his unpredictable behavior, but his portrayal as mad czar seems to be a bit harsh, contemplating his upbringing and his circumstances. Even though there is evidence that he was a hard worker and read widely, his sudden fits of rage and wild his sudden fits of rage and violence, paired with chaotic political decisions, resulted in general despair for him. Historians nowadays give Paul more credit, as some of his actions had good intentions, yet poor execution. Paul I will probably never be classified as a successful emperor, yet we can acknowledge that he has his silver linings and his is more than the title of the Mad Tsar.